Yeah, welcome back. Now to the interview with leader Lisa Peterson, the United States Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, who is also the head of the United States State, State Department's Bureau for Democracy and Human Rights. She was in Nigeria for a two-day meeting with various stakeholders last week, areas within her purview, labor, democracy, human rights. And we caught up with her. And I began the interview by asking that after the uh, as a 33-year veteran at the U.S. State Department who has served in not less than eight countries, including Nigeria, I asked her about her views on the wave of coup d'etat spreading across West Africa, including the latest in Burkina Faso, and what this means to the U.S. policy of nurturing democracy, its values, and its tenets. Burkina also is really part of a larger concerning trend. Um, you know, we've seen three separate coups in West Africa, um, and Burkina Faso is another change of authority within that original coup. Um, so obviously we're very concerned about the trajectory. We did have the opportunity to meet with ECOWAS while we were here. Um, we very strongly support ECOWAS's efforts to ensure that Burkina Faso is adhering to the timeline laid out um, and really keeping the pressure on the transitional authorities in all three countries to continuously move to a civilian-led democratic government. Mm. Three coups in West Africa. Uh, the U.S. continues to push for democratic values and inculcation of this in the political citizenry and all of that. How does this encourage the U.S. government, especially the Biden administration, to continue to support African countries whose military you know, go in this direction? Well, when military move in that kind of direction, there are actions that we have to take um, that limit our ability to work with governments who have gone through a coup. Um, that said, we are still very focused on the rest of the continent and frankly the rest of the world um, because there has been a consistent democratic recession over the past 16 years now. And so our work is really focused on strengthening the systems that move countries back onto democratic trajectories but also really trying to focus on the question that President Biden frequently speaks about of democracy delivers and we need to demonstrate that democracy delivers for people in ways that they can feel and see in their daily lives. And we remain convinced that democratic systems, systems where there are um, peaceful and um, population-driven changes of government through elections, systems that are accountable to the needs of their people, and systems that are transparent and hold corrupt officials to account are the systems that, at the end of the day, work best for people. And so we continue to work across Africa and across the world to really try to strengthen sort of muscle memory among governments and among populations to keep striving for that stronger form of democracy. Mm. Now, let, let's go to Nigeria, where, incidentally, you once served. Yes. Uh, it's getting close to 24 uninterrupted years of civilian democratic rule here. General elections are around the corner, and as usual, the American government will call for a transparent process. Mm -hmm. What have you observed that made you undertake this particular visit to Nigeria at this time? So I will be frank that it was the upcoming elections that really made us want to come here at this particular moment in time um, to be able to see from Washington. You know, we, we do hear from our embassy what is happening, but sometimes it's also helpful to see for ourselves how things are unrolling. And I think our sense is that the electoral preparations, the work of INEC continues to get better with each successive election. And so I think we're feeling very confident in the ability of INEC to run very credible elections. Um, 
I think our embassy in particular is keeping a close watch on statements from candidates and parties that are suggesting um, that they have seen a particular poll and that poll indicates that they are going to win the election and if they don't win that must mean that there has been fraud and that those are very dangerous statements to set up going into an election because at the end of the day uh, the only poll that really matters is the actual electoral poll um, and so I think it's very important, particularly for the leaders of the political parties, the candidates themselves, to be very responsible with their messaging and not set things up for people to start challenging results after they've come out. Mm. Okay, the, the, the U.S. Secretary of State, um, Anthony Blinken, was here in Abuja just under a year ago, November last year, and he met top officials. He also met President Mohamed Buhari. And he pledged you know, the Biden administration's commitment to supporting Nigeria in various ways. Now, um, Secretary Biden, Secretary Blinken, raised some concerns about the upholding of the rights of Nigerians at that meeting he held with his counterpart, Gov. Jeffrey Oyama. Uh, five months later in April, you, as the officer in charge of the um, Bureau for Democracy, Rights and Labor, presented the State Department's human rights report for countries for 2021 to the congress now i've, I've extensively read that that document that's the report that talks about nigeria i'll say it's a mixed one and uh, what specific areas would you say there have been improvements with regards to rights in nigeria and what areas do we need do you think we need to make progress on i do know that one of the meetings that we will be having today is with the minister of labor and i think Actually, that's an area where we have seen the government trying to take steps, particularly in trying to address child labor. Um, so that is that is the piece that comes most immediately to mind. Mm. Now, that, that report focuses on forced disappearances, um, torture, and various other areas. Um, it, it also focused on what had been done in the aftermath of the NSAS yes. protests in Nigeria. Uh, do you think the authorities have done enough to answer all the questions that, that your report brought to the fore? So we had an excellent conversation with the National Human Rights Commission yesterday and I think the National Human Rights Commission has done an excellent job of investigating um, what has transpired in police abuses, including the disappearances, the torture that you reference, um, and presenting their findings to government. I think it is now the government's responsibility to follow up and ensure that there is accountability where the Human Rights Commission has found officers that they have identified as culpable in these incidents and that there should be judicial processes and uh, some form of accountability because until you have that accountability mechanism there is really no incentive for anyone to do anything differently um, I know with the disbandment of SARS people may think that that is a victory and may think that um, we can simply move on from that place but it's the accountability piece that really makes sure that people think twice before they engage in such activities that are harmful, not just to the people who are themselves physically attacked, tortured, disappeared, but to their entire families and communities. Mm. That report extensively relies on an international organization, the um, Amnesty International, for some of what is contained in there. And Amnesty International has been having this running battle with the Nigerian government. Nigerian government keeps saying, look, your facts are not correct. Your facts are not correct. Um, those that put the report together, did they consider the fact that the government has objections to Amnesty International's findings, which your report picks a lot from? So in general, I think I need to separate things out a little bit. So I can't speak to exactly how the Human Rights Commission did their their processes. But I will say, 
for our purposes, when we are compiling our human rights reports, we do find Amnesty International a very credible source. Now, it would be rare for us to rely on a single source, um, even with a very reputable organization like Amnesty International, um, but they are an organization that we do consider highly credible in their work. Mm. So now, labor issues are part of what you seemingly handle at the State Department. That's why you're going to be meeting Dr. Chris Inge later today. Uh, and I'm also aware that the U.S. federal setup has its own Department of Labor, yes. separate from what you do in the State yes. Department. At the moment, um, a key union in this country, the one representing teachers in public universities, has been on strike for eight months counting. Mm -hmm. now, now, what parallels can be drawn from what obtains in the U.S., which runs a federal setup like Nigeria, and from where Nigeria copied this presidential system in terms of resolving such a such such, such um, a, a strike? Is it that we have a centralized labor system that negates the principles of federalism? What what, what parallels can we draw? Okay, you're catching me a little bit out because my understanding of the U.S. university te um, academic unions is quite limited, but I do think that there is a fundamental difference between our system and yours in that our higher education system is entirely private. Um, sorry, I forgot about state schools, but yours is a much more centralized system, and I suspect that that union action within that centralized system creates a different dynamic than in our system where it would be unions dealing with entirely individualized university systems. Mm. At, at the moment, the number of Nigerians who, due to what we have on ground now, who say, look, we're checking out, we're going to get higher education in the U.S., uh, the figures that we're getting is that it's increasing by the day U.S. investors are admitting more Nigerians. And people talk about the fact that eventually Nigeria will have a brain drain. People who should probably remain in the system after earning higher qualifications, work in the system. Some, they go to the U.S., they stay put. How is the U.S. or the Biden administration helping Nigeria address this particular challenge? So I think Nigeria has always been one of the highest... Um, percentages of students going and seeking education in the United States. Um, I will say one of the things that has that struck me about Nigerians when I was here, admittedly more than a decade ago, um, is that they do come back to Nigeria. Um, they may not come back immediately. Um, and they may, you know, following their education, may find ways to. Um, stay on professionally in the United States. Um, but I was struck, particularly after my many years in other countries on the continent, at the number of Nigerians I met who had gone to the States, spent time there, and then come back to invest in their own country. And I think there is a tremendous pull here in Nigeria. And while you may have the youngest who are going and seeking to sort of make their big strides early on in the United States, my expectation is that you will see a lot of them come back. And I think you still have a very dynamic young population who want to stay here um, and will stay here and continue to contribute in the tremendously creative way that Nigerians have. You've spoken about young people. Uh, the demographics shows that we have a huge young population, over 66%. Uh, not a few of them are into what we call, it's a local parlance, it's colloquial, it's called Japa. It and means, I want to run out of Nigeria, I want oh, to go really? to the West. Um, what are the things you think we could do in the country to keep this young, dynamic set of persons believing that things can work better for them, believing that they won't get into jobs where they'll be underpaid, you know, labor issues being... Uh, quote, slave labor and all of that? It is always going to depend on what kind of economic opportunities are here at home. Um, I should also caution that I think 
people have an image of life in the United States that does not always match reality. You know, I, a lot of people emigrate to the States and find that um, they have to work in fairly low-level jobs and it can be difficult to make ends meet in those low-level jobs. I think back to the Nigerians staying here, um, the economic opportunity piece, but I also think finding ways to make sure that young people's voices are elevated. And I think this is a challenge across the continent, and I will limit myself to Africa for the moment because there is a youth wave across the continent, and there are um, economies that may have been doing well before COVID and have really taken a hit after COVID. And now with inflationary pressures worldwide, that is making things even more difficult. But I do think finding ways to make sure that young voices are heard and young voices are included in decision-making processes, even if they can't be elected to office or if they are trying to be elected and don't make it, opening up channels of communication so that people are able to advocate in between elections and try to have their voices heard in decisions that will affect them, I think makes people more invested in the structures that they're living within. So finally, back to the um, questions on the forthcoming elections. You're, the, the step up, you're watching the process carefully. That's why mm -hmm. you're here. Once we're done with polling in February, what are your expectations from both the elected, those who get into public office, even at the highest level, and those who are following? Well, as I said, I think we are very confident in INEC's ability to run a very transparent and credible process. And so I think it's important for people to really abide by the results when they come out. Um, barring something that, you know, looks completely out of bounds. But again, I don't think our expectation is that we will see that here. So I think it is important that people abide by the results, that people remain peaceful, that leaders call on their followers to remain peaceful. Um, we have had some excellent engagement with faith communities while we were here. Um, I hope that the faith communities will do all in their power to make sure that people remain peaceful and that the country can quickly move into the next phase for Nigeria. Thank you so much, Ambassador Peterson, for talking to us. Thank you very much.